Praise the Lord. So I'm going to start with a question uh, today. If you were, you probably thought about something like this. If you were to uh, inherit, okay, like a million dollars, what would you do with it? Okay, what would you do with it? Or how about this? If you were to inherit a billion dollars, okay, that's like a thousand millions, I think, something like that. So there's, there's a big difference. If you were to inherit a billion dollars, what would you do with it? Now, India's uh, most wealthy person, Mukesh Umbani, uh, inherited, he was bequeathed, okay, that's the word, uh, Reliance in Industries uh, worth $106 billion. Like, okay, this is mine now, let's go. Uh, closer to home, you've got Rob and Alice Jim Walton. Each one of them inherited $70 billion each, essentially. Now, I, I don't know. I mean, those, those kind of numbers blow my mind. But if you were to be bequeathed that kind of resource, I wonder what would you do with it? Because the reality is some people actually get that kind of thing. And they have, they're faced with what do I do with all this? Now, you know, someone said, um, we know that money can't buy us happiness, but I'd like to prove that for myself. You know, like I've heard that. But, um, but today we're going to talk about, as crazy as this is, gang, Today, we're going to talk about an inheritance, a blessing, okay, is the word, but really inheritance that each of us have received that goes beyond any of that, any of what we could get here on this earth. And so as noted, we're talking about the promises of God in these, in these days, kicking off a new year. And uh, we're looking at the covenants that God has made with with us, okay, with certain people through the Old Testament in particular, and uh, today we're going to look at the promise that he made to Abraham. It's called the Abrahamic Covenant, right? We've looked at the Adamic Covenant, the Noahic Covenant, so there's all terms on this stuff, but today we're going to talk about some terms that we use that have been misused. A lot of terms, even in our culture, have been hijacked. It once meant something. Now we have to, well, what do we, what do we use now? Because that word has been hijacked. A lot of words like that. Like even blessed, you know what it is to be blessed, right? Hashtag blessed. Um, and often it's, um, uh, you know, material things, right? Let's be honest. Um, God's blessed me. And we, we, we tie it to all kinds of worldly things. But we're going to see that God has redefined these terms because we're going to talk about how we have each been blessed with an inheritance that brings security to our lives. We're all looking for that today. Uh, security, really, you know, safety, peace is the word. We're going to talk about how we have each been blessed with prosperity, a promise of prosperity. And again, that, okay, uh-oh, may, you know, and we, we, we think of the prosperity gospel. But God is going to promise Abraham, he's going to prosper him. And then another is we've been blessed with authority. And this is something, again, that's been misused. But we're going to stick with some of these terms because this is what's going on in the story. I want you to turn to Genesis uh, 15. You read this uh, this past week. I hope you have your dwell journal already um, and you're in it. Okay, if you don't have one, grab one on your way out because this is what we're doing uh, as a church family. Every member is walking through the word of God every day. You've read this text throughout uh, this week. In fact, every Friday is exactly the text for the sermon so you can get ahead. Gang, we are dead serious about the word of God because we believe he speaks to us, not simply when, you know, a pastor or someone steps up and has studied the passage for you. That's a good thing, but you can hear from God every single day. And so uh, I hope that you're doing that. Let's, um, Let's do this. Let's place this in context. First thing I want you to see is that God blesses us with security. All right. And again, there's a place to take notes on sermons here. The promise of blessing. The first thing I want you to see is that God blesses us with security. Now, context is king. We're learning this always in, in our pastor's study on Wednesday nights. You can join us. Open to everyone. Uh, check that out as well. But we're learning how to faithfully read God's word. And um, this is the story of Abram. You've probably heard of Abraham. I might use his name interchangeably. He becomes um, Abram, Abraham later in Genesis 17. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means uh, father of many, father of multitude, which comes to play in this story here. Uh, And a key moment in his life uh, is Genesis, uh, really Genesis 12, uh, place context here again, where 
God says to him, here's how, the, here's how you could frame the conversation. Hey, I want you to leave Ur of Chaldeans. I want you to leave your family's, your father's house. In other words, the place where you've grown up, you know, back in the day, they didn't fly around, you know, live elsewhere much. And I want you to leave. And Abram's, you know, well, uh, where am I going? I'll, I'll show you. Okay. And I want you to be the father of many nations. You're going to have a lot of descendants. And he's like, I don't, I don't have any kids. And God says, and... Well, yeah, but I'm like 75 and my wife is 65 and God goes, and I'm going to bless you. I, I promise. And where am I going? I will show you. Where's this land? I, you, you'll know. I'll show you. And then it says, and he went. So this is, there's some crazy stuff going on here, but by faith, he's out there now. Okay, and the passage before this, um, he has have to. He is, is uh, one of his family members. Lot, you might know that name. He's taken by this group of other nations or kings. These other groups, rebel groups, up against him. That's kind of how you know it went that day. He kind of goes John Wick on him, and he goes in. Abram goes in. He pulls Lot back. He gets him back. And, and so now he's got these others that are kind of, you know, could, could be greater, more powerful alliances up against him. So with all that context, okay, with all of that, he's in a very insecure place. Uneasy, whenever you step out in faith, it can bring about some insecurity because I'm trusting the Lord, but I haven't seen it yet. And then in verse one of chapter, uh, here it is, chapter 15, verse one. After these things, th those things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, all right? Fear not. I love that. He first says, don't be afraid, right? The most common command in scripture. I know you're afraid, all right? I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Like reminding him, remember chapter 12 for us. Remember that. But Abram said, oh Lord, what will you give me? For I continue to be childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring and a member of my household will be my heir. What he's saying is, and this employee of mine is going to end up with all my stuff because I don't have the son to pass on the inheritance. But here's what's going on. Watch this. And again, always seeking to apply. He is providing him immediate security. He's also providing long-term security. But he's also in the midst of this, we'll see it over and over again, he's given him security of the relationship. This is the most important thing. I am with you. I will never leave you and I'm gonna bless you. I told you I would bless you. I'm reminding you again that I will bless you. And it's why you're here today. It's why coming together in worship every single Sunday is so important already in the singing of the songs. All that he has done for us, you're reminded and it, and it combats the lies that you have been believing throughout the week that have created anxiety and worry in your life. So here's what I want you to do. I want to ask you, what is causing fear and insecurity in your life right now? Think on that. And maybe you would write it down. Name it. Because we're going to apply this passage to that. Our fear, listen, your fear is in direct correlation to the object of your faith, wherever you place your trust. That, that's what it is. We say it often. Don't ever place your trust in something that can be taken away from you. And when you think about it that way, I've talked about how your deepest uh, emotions point you to your idols. Because the fragility of your faith is based on the fragility of the object of your faith. If it's immovable, if you have, watch this, an anchor of the soul, that's what brings security in your life, right? So, so you need an immovable anchor. And as we, we continue to try to justify ourselves and validate our, ourselves, the biblical word is to, yeah, to justify myself in all these other things, right? Our possessions, our looks, our job, or our stuff, or our future. I gotta have secure, all things need to be secure and in place. It's in direct correlation to your need to control your life, which is a myth. This is why the story of Abram, it seems so wild to us, but we, none of us control our lives. Like we're just taking steps each day, right? So we are, if you're in Christ, be reminded today, we are heirs of a promise that comes from Christ himself, 
We've been given a new identity. In Genesis 17, he's literally going to have a, a new name. You've been given a new name if you're in Christ. You now belong to a new family. You are totally forgiven. Your identity is not achieved. It is received in the same way that Abraham has received what's happening. He's saying this. Y'all listen, this is so important. God is saying to Abram, I am outside of time, so live as if, here it is, as if this has already happened. Think about it. God's outside of time, so you, you could argue he's already seen it. He already has seen what's happening, and he's seen it in your life. He already sees the other side of the hurdle that you're in. In fact, Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4 says, in Christ, we've been blessed, there's the word, with every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He chose us in him. He, he knew that this was going to happen so that, and he plays this out, so that you should be holy and blameless before him. We sang about it earlier. It might seem weird. And if you're a guest today and you know, maybe a lot of this is new to you, we're singing about the blood of Christ. When you think about it, that's a little, little funky, unless you really understand what he's done, how precious is his blood. It covers me. It's made me righteous. I have a new identity now. And, and we're going to see how this plays out. This is an amazing passage that maybe you've never heard taught before as we get into it. Look at verse four. So we have security in him. Okay. Secondly, um, we're going to see as we move towards, we have prosperity as well. But look at verse four. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. He's saying, your very own son shall be your heir. This is just a moment of clarity for Abram. In other words, he hears from the Lord and he goes, okay, wow, I'm believing this. Like, this is clear. And gang, this is why God's word is so important to be in his word every single day. Because we, it's confirmed again. We hear it again. And when you read his word, because it is the power of God. Spirit of God speaking to us through his word. We read his word, bam, this security comes back to us and we're centered again with whatever anxieties and worries you have. And listen, think about the secure foundation we have in Christ. If you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you cannot lose your salvation. If you have truly, and, and how do you, how, what's proof? You're persevering, you're growing in him. You, you want to know more about him. That's proof of the fact you've been saved. But think about that. You, you have this secure foundation. You can't lose your salvation because you didn't gain it. And I've said it before. If you could lose your salvation, you would. Promise you. I would. He's got us secure in him. He will not let us go. And that's what he wants Abram to see here. Okay. Now, secondly, look at this. God blesses us with prosperity. Again, I told you I wrestled with this word. It's been hijacked, misused because of prosperity gospel, which is this name it, claim it kind of thing. You know, that if you do this, God will do this. But this is, this is the question. What is true prosperity? Because I think we kind of run from it, but what does it really mean to prosper? Because we often do think of possessions of plenty. It's success, true success in a word. God redefines the terms and he does it here. Now check out this dramatic moment in Abram's life. Look at this verse five. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars. I just imagine this amazing uh, moment. If you're able to number them, of course, it implies you, you can't count them. And, and so God is saying, you see the stars? I did that. I, I did that. And I'm going to do this in your life as well. He said, so shall your offspring be. Another way of saying, you, you're not going to be able to count them. You can't count them. And, and, he, and he said to him, like, so think about this, Abram, you're not just going to have a son. I mean, I'm going to bless you with generations to come. And we'll see here. It's an everlasting blessing, which impacts us today is why we're even talking about this. And then it says, we see this in Romans 4, where Paul uses this to describe salvation. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. That, that's a, a way of saying, and he was made right before God because of his faith. Not because of anything he did, but because of his faith in God. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, oh Lord, God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? 
And this is interesting. This is the first place we see he, the name Yahweh is here. I know we think of the, the Exodus story often with Moses. He says, my name's Yahweh. And he's, what he's saying is, I have a name. We have a personal relationship here. This is who I am. Yes, I created all this, but I have come close to you. And, and here's the key question, gang. This is where the sermon pivots. This is the part that is so amazing before we close this out. The key question he's asking, how will I know? How, do I, how will I know? And then God will say, um, I'll show you. So don't miss this. With Abram, questions and faith coexist. Don't let questions sh- you know, strike terror in your heart. Any thinking person is going to ask questions. Abram's asking a lot of questions. How will I know? I was talking to someone this morning. How do you know if you're saved? How, how, how do I know really? How, do, how will I know? Okay, you're going to know. Before this is all done, you're going to know. The key question, how can I know? And then look, God says, let me show you. Watch this. Then this is so wild because we will explain this, but we don't, we don't live at this time. But watch this. He said to him, here's how you know. Bring me a heifer three years old. What? A female goat three years old. A ram three years old, a turtle dove, and, uh, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these things. He cut them in half and laid them each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came along, the, down on the carcasses, <laughs> Abram had to drive them away. That's just a little detail. It seems like he's been here a while. This took some work. But he already has these things. That's amazing too. God blesses him with the very thing he wants him to give to him. And this is more than just a sacrifice. What in the world is happening here? This is something that Abram would have known. This is how they ratified covenants, watch this, between one another, like a king and a vassal. Let's say you, had, you, come, you come upon another uh, ruler or leader of a group of people. All right, y'all, let's, let's enter into this covenant. And here's what they're doing. They, they, he cuts these animals up, lays the carcasses down on the ground. And did you catch this? They, they're split in half. And so you have this aisle between them. All right, sounds funky. Um, There's these dead animals laid out. And then what they do is uh, generally the king and a vassal or a master and a servant, the lesser, the one in authority, but the lesser would walk through the, the pieces and say, here it is. Let this happen to me. How dramatic is this? If I don't keep my part of the covenant, let this happen to me. Now, this, again, this is wild and strange. This is a culture of orality. They didn't have attorneys. They didn't have litigation and documents and all this stuff. They acted it out. That's wild. Now, this week, I met with a couple. I'm doing their their wedding um, soon. And what we'll do, as we do every wedding, I will take the the marriage, um, you know, certificate, Okay. Um, and it comes from the, the county clerk's office. We get this marriage license is what it is. And so they can profess their love for each other, but becomes a legally binding contract. Okay. Covenant goes beyond contract. Contract says, I'll keep my part as long as you keep yours. If you don't, I'm out. Covenant says I'm in regardless. And so I, I talked to this couple and I said, what if I got an idea? Like, what if what if at your, at your wedding, we just like laid, just took a heifer, you know, and then like a goat and took some animal, just cut them up, laid them out. And let's have, let's say, you know, the groom is down there. You come and meet the bride midway. Like y'all are both coming in here and you're saying, if, if I don't keep my covenant with you, I mean, yeah, we can just change rings and do the, do all the things. But if I don't let me become like one of these dead animals. And then um, Valerie Burstrom got involved, our wedding coordinator. She said, Jeff, we're not going to do that. And I said, but it'd be so memorable. Like, you'd never forget this. And, of course, I didn't do that. But, but you get the idea. But there's an amazing twist, gang, in this acting out of this kind of a death wish. And I say that because marriage still is the closest thing we have to covenant. Covenantal love and agreement, legally binding and bound by the heart is what covenants are. So look at verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. Now, all this is crafted so carefully. A dark kind of smoke, a darkness comes over him, uh, and behold, dreadful, this is like, and so look, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. 
Now you're going, well, what's going on here? Well, he, he is now, he's not just exhausted from doing all this, I suppose, but he is engulfed. He is, here's what it is. This is a holy fear. You kind of sense that just reading it. Like something else is going on here. He's not just sleeping. He's not just falling out here. This is a holy reverence, fear before a holy God. Because watch this. If you don't have holy fear and reverence before God, you will never fully experience holy presence, even holy peace and joy before the Lord. I, we miss this in our day, gang. And let me just challenge us as we gather for worship. Some of us come in here way too casually. And what I mean is of the heart. I'm not talking like we can't talk to each other, hang out, and what's up, how's your week going, all the things. But if we don't set our hearts before him and, and, and get here ready to be here and to, to say, yes, Lord. Because see, J James 4.10 says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Until you humble yourself before God with holy fear, you'll never be lifted up by him. But here's what happens because we don't often voluntarily humble ourselves. What happens is life circumstances. God allows us to go through so many things that we will be humbled for our good. We'll be humiliated for our good so that we will turn to him and see how desperate we are for him. And so look at verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain. Okay, remember the key question. Abram said, how will I know? Okay, know for certain, he's going to parse this out for him, that your offspring will be sojourners in the land. He's saying there's trouble coming. And, and, and it's, it's not going to be their land and, and will be, be servants there. And they'll be afflicted for, for 400 years. So how am I going to know this? Okay, he's not finished with the ratification um, ceremony. Okay, that's coming. Then he says, but I will bring judgment on the nation. He's saying, I got your back. I told you, I'm going to bless those who bless you but I am with you. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, he's, watch this. He's giving him very personal instruction. You're, 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 you're going you're gonna to go to your fathers in peace. You're going you're gonna to live uh, you know, old. You're going to be buried in old age. He's like, I'm already 75. No, you're going to be older and they shall come. I'm just starting with you, by the way, at 75. That's a word for somebody here. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet done. What he's saying is the, there's going to be a lot of trouble. The Amorites, the evil's not finished. You're going to go through a lot. But he's saying true success, peace is what we're looking for today, will come. I was at a memorial service this week in our, in our church talking to one of our members and how these conversations go. When you think about eternity and death, and we were talking about how, you know, at the end of the day, it all comes down to faith. All that matters, where is this person in Christ? That's all that matters now. Um, and, and yes, in the end, faith and, and family, you can say friends and family. But I can tell you often when I'm, you know, at the bedside, in a hospital room or with a family. It's, it's faith and family. And if you, do you don't have much family or here in, in Dallas, we, we are family, brothers and sisters, even closer than biological families, that we can do this thing together. But we know this, friends, to re be reminded today is not possessions. It's not power. It's not popularity. What God is promising him is rest and clarity, clarity, certainty. And that brings peace. It's what you need today is true gospel, soulful peace. And that only comes in right relationship with God. But don't miss this ultimate success in life. We see this with every person he makes a covenant with and with you. Ultimate success in our life is the presence of God upon us. That's ultimate success in life. And it says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, I love this. It says that all of his promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. All of his promises are yes and let it be in Christ Jesus. And so don't miss this. Material, earthly prosperity is not success. What are you pursuing today? What are you running after? Are you running hard after Jesus are you in his word to say, Lord, remind me again of how much you love me? Because I've been, here's what happens. I've been all around the world to Africa, to India, to South America, places like that, 
where, and we heard from Jojo last week, when you look at the 1040 window, a kind of across the, a portion of the most unreached people groups in the world, um, oftentimes the, the message that is preached in these places when you go there is the prosperity gospel. We go into Africa, for instance, I'm training a group of pastors and the thing I'm teaching, let's get back to the gospel. And now they, you know, many of them discern and know, but they know too, how do you grow a church? Preach that if you come to Jesus and um, give your life to him, he's going to give you a lot of great stuff. And if you give to me, right, then he's going to bless you with material blessings and health and all the things. And that's not the gospel. But, but we think, well, we know that that's not the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is you get Jesus and all the blessings that come with him, the, the security he brings, the true prosperity he brings. And we're going to talk about the authority he brings in your life, authority over spiritual darkness and to obey him. These are the things that matter most in life. And, and so we can step into that and say, that's the real deal. You get Jesus and whatever comes your way, he's enough. He's more than enough, right? But most of us here, we're going, yeah, I get that. But you know, too, the gospel, the prosperity gospel is preached here in America as well. And sometimes they're the most popular preachers among people. We can name people, you know, who, who are like, okay, that's, wow, you do this and God will do this. Like he's big, you know, it's always that law of reciprocity, right? And we know that that, at least here, I would hope, you know, that's not theologically correct. And yet, here's what we do oftentimes. It's people who leave the church, who who lose their faith, if you will. How about this? People who don't pray. I mean, can I preach for a minute? The reason that many of us don't pray like we should or maybe giving up on prayer is because we, we tried it. I, told, I wanted God to do this thing and he didn't do it. And so again, see, there's two ways to avoid God. How about this? One is to just not have faith in him altogether. The other is to say, okay, God, if you will do this, then I, I will do this. And again, a law of reciprocity, seeking to control the outcomes, manage outcomes before God Almighty. And when he doesn't come through, you're out. And many people stop praying because of that. They, they kind of drift away thinking, well, I don't know if any of this is really true. Because you have become the God of your own religion. You've placed yourself in that place. But God comes to us and, and he says, this is a covenant. This is not a contract. And I'm bringing you, I'm going to bless you with security. I'm going to bless you with prosperity, real prosperity. And I'm going to bless you with authority. All right. So here, here's another word that's been misused a lot. But we have all authority to bless others because of the blessing we receive. We say it often. We're blessed to be a blessing, right? And the moment you stop being a conduit of the blessings that God's given you, including the truth that you know and all that you've been given, the moment that you stop leveraging that to bless others, it will draw you away from God. And the things he's given you and blessed you with will cease to give you joy of any kind. There'll be trouble for you. And even more often, he'll just take it away and say, I'm, I'm giving this to somebody else because you're not stewarding what I have given to you, your time, your knowledge, all that you, you're not, you're not blessing others. You're not involved in ministry. You're not serving others. But then here God gets back to watch this. This is what I've been looking forward to, to sharing before we close. He gets back to the, the, the covenant ceremony. This is miraculous. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Okay. Now I'm going to get back to that. Let's finish this verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with him. Okay. I'll go back and say, what does all this mean? What is this smoking fire pot and flaming torch with Abram? And he said to, to your offspring, I give this land for the, for the river, from the river of Egypt, the great river and to the river Euphrates. He's, he's laying out the, really the promised land. Okay. The land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cabanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, Raphaim, the Amorites, Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites, the Termites, all the Tites, all of them. There's so many of them. But what, what he's doing there, this, this list of 10 nations is actually the same that uh, are in, when they go in, eventual mandate to take the land. These are the ones that are there in the land. They conquered the land. 
And Abram's descendants are blessed with authority. Not just Abram, but everyone who's to come. But don't miss this. Everyone who follows Abraham, Abram, is a person of faith, made righteous by faith, not because we are a bloodline of Abraham. He's saying, all you people, we see this throughout scripture then, everybody who's in the, in the promised land, who is going to come to ultimately the promised land, which is eternal life, who will come to Christ, they are people of faith. God is establishing an eternal covenant with his people. People are justified by faith, not by works. Okay, so let's get back to verse 17. Here we go. This whole sermon to, to land it here. The, the fire and the flame represent the presence of God. Okay, they represent God. It's like the, 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 fire, the, pillar, you know, pillar, the pillar of fire that'll come later. This is a, a reference that God is, watch this. Now, here's the image again. Um, and I know it sounds, sounds crazy. Carcasses, dead animals, an aisle in the middle. Watch what goes through. The pre God himself goes through the one with all authority. Comes through. He comes down and he walks through making a covenant agreement with Abram. What does Abram do? Nothing. He's like sleeping. I mean, he's, he does nothing. He just sees this. And so God comes through. The one with all authority steps in and says, okay, I am going to go through. Abram doesn't go through. He doesn't say, now you come. God comes and he goes through this, this um, covenantal ratification ceremony saying, what's this? Let this happen to me. If I don't keep my side of the covenant, and if you're tracking with me here, you know that while we were yet dead in our transgressions, Christ comes to us. God makes this covenant entirely based on his will and his work. Not Abram, not us. So God is saying, I promise to bless you. Now, Abram, if you're thinking, he, he, he's thinking, okay, well, okay, you're faithful. I get it. But what if I'm not faithful? Because I'm not going to be faithful. And God says, I know. That's why I haven't even asked you to enter into this thing. It's a one-way covenant. Yeah, but what do I do? Believe. Oh, oh. I want, what? Why just believe? Like, can't I do something? Like, I'll meet you midway. And why do we want to do that? Because we want to leverage the relationship. We want it to be a contract. But if you're in your right mind, like, like I hope we are this morning, no, you don't. No. Because you become like these animals. So Jesus comes, the one with all authority. There was another day to come. Hundreds of years later, the land grew dark. God himself comes in the person of Jesus Christ. He lives the perfect life for us. The one who's given all authority comes and he ends up saying, I'll take this on myself. I'll validate the, co the covenant. I will justify everyone else when there was no way. Jesus makes a way so that Paul would say in Hebrews 6, I love this, listen to this. For when God made a promise to Abraham, he gives commentary on this. Watch this. Since he had nobody else to swear by, he swears by himself. I don't know if you've read this. Saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having waited patiently, he waited and he obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves and in all their disputes. An oath, a covenant, is final for confirmation. So, look at verse 17. It's on the screen there. So, when God desired to show more convincingly to his heirs, the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character, unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, with a covenant, so that by two unchangeable things, okay, what are they? God's word and the covenant made. Now the covenant made in Christ that he has come to die on the cross for us, in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Do you have the sure, fast anchor of your soul today? Have you received Christ? Because an anchor doesn't just go down and float down in the water below the boat. It does nothing. It goes into the bedrock. It goes into the ground. 
And it is immovable. Because look at this, a hope that enters into this inner place behind the curtain, into the Holy of Holies, before God Almighty, where we could not go, where Jesus is gone, the forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He mentions Melchizedek because the chapter before we looked at today, he runs into Melchizedek, a priest and king. Jesus comes, the priest the bridge between us, the king above all kings. Have you received your inheritance? Have you received this bequeathment that has come to you? Are you saved? Have you received Christ? Are you in right relationship with him? Or are you still seeking to justify yourself? Are you still trying to work your way to God through your own security, your own prosperity, your own authority? You see, and here's the thing, I'll land here. In Christ You've been given authority. Again, this is something maybe we, we should talk a lot more about. Christ, all those nations are mentioned. Jesus comes and he gives us the great commission to go into all the world, all the nations. Now it's not just a little plot of land. All this argument over Israel, it's gone way past Israel. The new promise is to God's people, not the Israelites of old, but every person of faith now receives the inheritance and the whole world is, is the land. And he sends us out into the world. And he says, all authority has been given to me. Now go. I give you authority to go. Friends, listen, somebody need to hear this. You have authority over sin in your life. You have authority over the lies that you have been taught throughout your life that are on repeat. You have authority over that with God's word, not your own authority. Why you need to know God's word. He is the covenant keeper. You have eternal security in him if you have received him. So here's the challenge as I land this. This is the year, gang. Could it be that God brought you right here, right now to hear this word from him, from him. It's time to leave your sins behind. It's time to leave habitual sin behind, to confess it, to say it out loud. It's time to leave behind your lack of commitment to him. After this event, in Abram's life, if he had any kind of casual relationship with God, I promise you, after this, he did not anymore. And we see it throughout the rest of his life. When you encounter God, you no longer have a casual relationship with him. You don't just kind of strut into church and in his presence, like, okay, show me something. What? You come humbly before him. You believe, and I just got to say this, claiming to believe the Bible and not being in it is a joke. I'm just challenging us again for your good. I so want you to experience this kind of security, this kind of prosperity, this kind of authority. We can live with authority because of what he's done for us. It's time. It's time to commit our lives to him. This is your day. So let's all close our eyes and come before him now as I close our time. I want you to pray, Lord, thank you for this time. And I'm gonna give you a moment. You've heard a lot here, an amazing story with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Just focus now. One of the most, one of the clearest pictures of the gospel we see in the whole Old Testament. Christ body has been torn for you. He has taken on the one-way covenant upon himself. He's done your part. He lived the perfect life for you. He died so that you wouldn't have to. He took on the punishment so that you could praise him just by faith. Say yes. And for many of us today, a good prayer is, Lord, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. Pray that prayer. But if you've never received Christ, may it be now, today. Settle that. Say yes to him. Say, Lord, come, come into my heart. I believe. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I give you my life. And, and here's, here's a challenge for some of us here, friends. If you're not yet committed as a member of the church. Take that step today. Say, I'm entering into this covenant community. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to enter in. Or, or to proclaim your faith through baptism. 
It's time. Lord, I pray for courage for all of us who need to make decisions today. And I praise you for how you are at work in our church and in our lives. I thank you for how you're moving in my life. You alone are worthy of it all. So we give you our lives fully. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Let it be. All right, let's do this. I'm going to close this out, but I want to just challenge you. If you want to come and talk to one of us here at the front, we'll be here to bless you and to pray over you. Maybe you just need someone to pray for you today. You got some overwhelming things. Uh, Before you leave, let us pray for you. If we can help you find a connect group, you can go downstairs in the commons and they'll guide you. And listen, let me encourage you as you go to your connect groups or whatever you might do. If you're leaving, don't, don't just get in the elevator and go. Go down in the commons and learn more about our different partners and how you can get involved. That might be the prompt today. It's for you to say, I need to be committed to actually helping others. Incredible ministry partners we have. You've seen our calling probably on the news who've been helping those out in the cold and homeless people. We we are, they're here today and we're here to help support them. Go encourage all of our partners. Maybe you do that as much as anything. Okay. So let's all stand together and I want to offer this benediction as we go. And And it is this, be blessed today. You are a blessing to, to me, you're a blessing to each other. You're a blessing to the world. And I want you to go and remember that God has promised to bless you with real security in him. that cannot be taken away. He's promised to, to bless you with real prosperity. So leverage that for the sake of others. And he's promised to bless you with authority over your family, over your relationships, over your worries and your troubles. Speak truth into your life and speak truth to others as we go to share the gospel with everyone in the world. So have a great day and we love you. Have a wonderful day.